Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Caddy Cube Tuesdays. I'm Jason Barnard. I'm going to be talking to Jason Davis, the two Jasons on screen at the same time, talking about Pretty Is Easy, Smart Is Hard, a slightly cryptic title, but talking about design and branding. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct, yes. Uh, there's a methodology in, in things, yes. Everything is an ad. A quick hello and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Jason Davis. Welcome. I love that is an ad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's my single best talent. Um, <laughs> it's going to be delightful talking to you about this because I think we don't really consider design enough and how important it is and how impactful it is. And there's that thing, an image is worth a thousand words or whatever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way we design stuff also affects the way we read and we scan uh, pages and content. So I think this is hugely important. Before diving into that, and I know you're going to tell us so much about this, let's look at your brand set because that's what we always do. Yeah. Nerd Brand is your company, and I can see you and your team there on the right-hand side looking delightful. And I really wanted to point out your rich site links, contact us, agency services, Nerd Brand podcast, Nerd Brand agency blog. That's perfect. Contact us. Let us know how we can be of service. We know exploring, blah, blah, blah. Most brands get this wrong. And I've been focusing on this the last few days. And I was looking at yours. I was thinking I could pick holes in it and hit holes in it, and I can't. Absolutely brilliant. Next yeah. up is I've noticed at the top, sorry, here, you've got two podcasts. And you've got this one, the marketing podcast Nerd Brand. And I found it on Google Podcasts. And it's actually one episode of the other podcast that's been separated for some reason. And this is the main podcast with all the other episodes in it. And it's because one is called the Nerd Brand Podcast and one was called just Nerd Brand. And you can see both here, which is slightly confusing. Now, that isn't me criticizing. It's saying, isn't it strange when you make one small mistake? Yeah. Things split up and you end up with duplicates. Well, we had an issue with Spotify where Spotify picked up for, or for some reason duplicated the show. So in oh. one instance on Spotify, it has our thumbnail and there's like a, a black diagonal design that we did. And then on the actual live Spotify that's updated because we use Buzzsprout, um, it's a solid, just the solid blue, you know, thumbnail. So that's the actual current one. We're still trying to figure out like what happened on Spotify to create wow. second one. And we look through our links on our website and they're all current and going to the right one. So I guess it's just legacy from having right. content. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and if I take a step back then, I'm saying not one small mistake from you. It's a small mistake or a major mistake from somebody else. And we were working with Michael Carr, who somebody linked to his website from the actor's uh, IMDB profile, and now Google thinks that our client is the actor who is now deceased. And it's somebody completely random who did this on IMDB out of our control. And all of a sudden, we've got to sort out this mess. So I think it's a really important lesson. You've had it with Spotify, is these platforms make mistakes, and it's up to mm -hmm. us to sort them out. Yeah, and there's so Valuable many... lesson learned. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, right, I wanted to put this up because... Most of us say, what is branding? And you're saying, what branding isn't? Can you explain this? Yeah. So we, uh, uh, my partner and Mitch and I, Mitch is our creative director at Nerd Brand, and Jonathan is our chief experience officer and myself. We sat down and was like, look, we're getting, like, what is branding? People don't really know what it is. They're familiar with marketing because it's sold to them every day, but it's very, like, executable thing. Sometimes there's strategy involved with it. But every time they think branding is a logo. <laughs> so we said... Mm -hmm. Okay, instead of trying to like explain and persuade through copy or language or whatever what branding is, we're like, well, Google does that just fine if you just Google it. So when approached to us, we'll just kill like what it isn't. And so we're saying it's not a logo, not a tagline, not a product. We even go as far as saying it's not your website. These are expressions of your brand, but they are not branding. Uh, right. Just like you decide to wear red shirts that's an expression of your brand, your express to quote, I guess, Madonna from the nineties, you're expressing yourself. And that's really, it translates right over to brands and companies the same way they're expressing themselves. And this is how they want to do yeah. it. So it, it, if you think about it like that, you start to go, okay, so that's why what branding is, is connecting me and the customer here at the heart, not 
this logical, I'm going to convince you that I'm the cheapest option. It's, I love this brand. I'm having this great experience with it. So it doesn't matter. I may go grab Cheerios. I'm not going to ever grab the Cheery Ups, you know, that's in the Kroger aisle. That's kind of the <laughs> you know, philosophy. <laughs> right. And then you end with, because everything is an ad, mm -hmm. which is a delightful phrase. Can you give me a philosophical overview of what that fundamentally means to a business, thinking of everything as an ad? Yeah, so um, our creative director is really good at these axioms, and this is one of his, and we latched onto that as one of our, I guess you could say, temples in our philosophy of branding, um, mm -hmm. because people forget that wherever you put your logo, wherever you go, your reps, what they say, however they present themselves, it's representing your company, which essentially is an ad. It's a thing mm -hmm. that says, this is who we are, this is what we do, and we are going to deliver. It's not a slogan. A slogan is like a promise that can be broken, in my opinion, whereas a philosophy mm -hmm. like this is like, no, this is what we do. This is what we believe and what we will deliver on every time. And yeah. Right. No, which is lovely. And kind of uh, we were talking in the Caddy Cube team about what we're doing in terms of outreach. And Leanne pointed out to me exactly what you're saying is this doesn't reflect your brand. And if it was indeed, as you say, an ad, I'd be going, oh, no, no, we're not going to do that. So we've really worked it all. And I think thinking to myself from now on, if I were paying for this as an ad, would I go with it? And is it advertising, which is what ad means, what it is we're offering and to whom and why we're credible and why you would want to work with us? And part of that as well, the branding design that we're going to be talking about or that we are already talking about <laughs> is how do I design my brand and project my brand, advertise my brand to attract the right people? Yes, that's an incredibly good point. Um, and it's kind of funny that it, for us, a lot of people are catching on to that now. And I don't mean to be demeaning to anybody, but it's like, do you want the $5 customer or do you want the $50 customer? Yeah. Uh, depending on how you position yourself and how the perception is of your brand, this is not even marketing. Uh, you know, that's going to determine on who you're going to hit the most. And, uh, you know, I want the $50 one, frankly, because I don't have to work as hard. <laughs> Right. And I think that's a lot of uh, something that a lot of people forget is you get the five dollar client and the five dollar client's going to spend a lot of your time, mm -hmm. waste a lot of your time because they don't necessarily respect what you're doing. Whereas the fifty dollar client presumably or hopefully respects what you're doing and tends to waste less time. So you're actually weighing on both fronts. Yeah. Yeah. And or you could come across a five dollar. We've had five dollar clients that have become fifty dollar clients. Right. The, the time that it takes to do that, though, it is kind of a decision from the business angle, not the brand angle to say, OK, I, I believe the product they're selling. I see I as a visionary, I can see where this is going and I can map out where it's going. But that's mm -hmm. very difficult to do. Not everybody's got a great product. Not everybody's got a great you know, system or anything set up or they may have bad processes and operations internally are garbage. And that could lean into that decision to not take that $5 client and hope one day, cross your fingers, they become a $50 client. <laughs> right. Yeah. And the internal processes are something that scare me as a company boss is I'm really, really concerned that there might be a, a fault in the process. And I work very, very hard to create processes with the teams to make sure that it all runs smoothly and that the number of times it goes wrong is absolutely kept to a minimum. Uh, somebody talked to me about a robust system, Gert Malak. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody's got holes in their processes. I don't think there is a perfect one. If there is, yeah. then, I mean, you know, that company's probably sitting up there with trillions of dollars like Apple or others, I suppose. But I even mm. think Apple's got problems, and, and we can see that. We know Google does, and, and as well, too. I mean, everybody does, and it's okay. Um, are you working on them? And that kind of leans into well, that pretty, pretty easy, smart is hard point we're coming into because, yeah, you got to be smart. You got to think about it. <laughs> right, yeah, and being self-conscious and self-aware and being honest mm -hmm. with yourself and saying, right, we're going to work hard to make this better. But now we can move over to pretty as easy, smart is hard in the design aspect. Pretty as easy. I'm not convinced. I think pretty is pretty hard. <laughs> so the reason why pretty is easy is because it's a very subjective thing. Smart uh -huh. is hard because it's objective. So we're actually kind of saying, mm. okay, this is subjective, this is objective. 
So when you do something that's pretty, there really isn't a thought or plan or strategy behind on why you're making it. And this is where we get into that. Why uh, are you doing what you're doing? Um, because it goes back to what you just said about the $5, $50 customer, like we talked about there. So uh, the sophistication of design, you can actually see it. And believe it or not, I left this on so everybody could see Wonder Woman behind me. Let me go lean right. here. There you go. So a lot of people say that poster is is pretty, but you'll notice the composition of it, where she's at, where power is search uh, is at, and then below that is her logo, and then very tiny at the bottom is all the creds and everything about the movie. So it right. makes the character the main point. But look at how it starts out red on this side, kind of goes blue up into the upper corner. So there's everything mm. about this that's that's functional as a as a design that makes it desirable for people to buy this. They actually made three of these before the movie came out. I got like this one and another one downstairs. I never got a hold of the third one that was like a first release. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but then you have stuff that's good enough and Transformers, this is like a, the second issue. You look right. at that and that's kind of a little bit from, I know it's hard to see, but that's a little bit like messy, but then you have to think about the era that it was made in and it's targeting a younger audience. So, you know, if this is for kids, that's great. But believe it or not, Wonder Woman that was made for adult. Well, let's just say adult children. <laughs> right. Yeah. And for anybody who's listening to the podcast and can't see the images, we've got a poster of Wonder Woman behind Jason. And it looks incredible and very powerful and very... Uh, what, what would we... It's a, it's a film I would be excited to see, as you said, as an adult child. Mm -hmm. And then behind is another tiny, tiny poster of Transformers, which is slightly dated and very much more for children. Yeah, it's very cartoony in its design, which is OK. And so that's what I mean by pretty is easy because it can be subjective, but they're both intentionally done that way. We know as nerds oh. that comic book art is really an art. Um, and when you kind of compare you know, um, what, uh, what, uh, Stanley, Stan Lee's partner that did uh, a bunch of runs. I always drop the ball. Kurt, Jack Kirby, is that his name? I um, don't know. Cause I'm not, a, I a, yeah, a, I, I, I'm going to get butchered online. People are like, why don't you know that name? It's like, well, my brain hit a plot <laughs> hole today. Um, his designs were dominant across, you know, comic books and they were very much very vibrant. We saw them kind of played out in the movie Thor, um, mm. you know, uh, Ragnarok. Uh, we saw that we see them in, in Guardians of the Galaxy movies as well. Uh, so the design of those movies and how they're kind of done from a storyboard standard are to, to grab you and rope you into something. So, and that's where smart is hard comes in because the design has to be done in a way to kind of capture your attention and keep it. Mm. Uh, and then you start to build like uh, an affin a feeling, affinity, I guess is what to say for it, where you start to really love it. Like you talk about Guardians of the Galaxy and everybody's like, I love that movie. That's awesome. Like I've never heard anybody say like, oh, that's crap. I wish they had done some other music. Right. It, it's, yeah, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say it. I've got no idea. But yeah, I've never seen it. But now if you, you have heard somebody say it. Yeah. If you should, you should watch the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie and you'll be blown away how they okay. incorporate design in the music because they have different sets because it's in space. So they have to create these different worlds. Um, really? It's very thought out. It's very, it's very, it's something. It's just something to see. Brilliant. Uh, and what one thing that strikes me about the two posters in this discussion is know your audience. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you yeah. were supposed to expand on that. It wasn't a question. It was a kind oh, of sorry. open statement yeah. where you go, yes, if you know your audience. Yeah. I think uh, um, I'm really good at like pointing out failures in a way that, that that didn't work out for those that may know, like the Batman Returns movie with Michael Keaton back in the night in the early, early 90s. Mm. Um, Why didn't that work? Well, McDonald's put out a bunch of toys and their Happy Meals for kids, which sort of linked into the parents thinking it's a kid movie, like, you know, under the age oh, of 10 yeah. or around that. Now, for those of us that have seen the movie and saw the ending with Danny DeVito that played the Penguin and how gruesome his death was, that's not very kid friendly. Mm. And so when Tim Burton went back to the studio to pitch the third one, uh, there was this hesitation. And simultaneously around this time as we were going to get a Nicolas Cage as a Superman, by the way. Um, oh, really? you know, <laughs> it was crazy era. Um, but they were like, yeah, we kind of got some backlash from parents and complaints, blah, 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 blah. Mm. You know, long story short, he ended up with Val Kilmer as Batman and, 
the director and Michael Keaton exited the project as a result. But I've never seen a Tim Burton film that wasn't dark. So it's mm. sort of a misstep on the toy line because, you know, oh. I've got a toy hanging here of Batman and you can't really see any of the detail. Sorry about that. But it's like, it just come to me like this is designed again for adult. I say adult kids, people my age, 35 to 45, yeah. um, you know, you may buy that for your 10 year old and that's fine, but that's actually the Ben Affleck Batman of one of the Zack Snyder universe of, of, of that right. very dark. So know your audience and what you're going to sell from a toy line, from art, from promoting a movie, anything you do when you put that out there, it's, it's an ad because it's reflective of what you're, you're trying to promote as oh, a yeah. brand for that audience. So. Can we, can we stick on the child topic and talk about ice cream? Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's really easy to eat, but apparently it's very difficult to sell, according to somebody I know, and I can't remember who it was. <laughs> yeah, so ice cream is not really easy. It's not, uh, everybody knows, like, well, it's not good for you. I mean, it's not meant to be, like, you know, a third course meal or something at dinner, right? It's a treat. Um, but everything in moderation. Uh, but mm. people want to be healthy in everything they do. They want ingredients to be natural and, um, you know, we had a pizza brand here in the States that was basically talking about how their ingredients were superior to other uh, pizza chains right. kind of caused the problem. This is back in the late nineties, I believe. Um, and ingredients are important where you source them from. And that's where you kind of get into like thinking that, well, it's ice cream. It's easy to sell. But then you're like, well, people want to know what's it made of. What's the nutritional value. Then you get into FDA regulations here in the States and everything else. It's got to be shown. And you're like, Oh, what's the calorie count? And you're like, I don't know. It just tastes good. <laughs> that's where you start to trip up a bit. <laughs> right. And so from that perspective, everything is an ad mm -hmm. in terms of ice cream. How does that kind of uh, present itself? Because you've got the, actual advertisements you've got the shop you've got the the cones they use you've got the cups they use you've got the logo on the bin outside uh, how how does that present itself S smart is hard in ice cream yeah so you end up with um the colors you choose to use Ooh. for your designs and stuff for like a yep. website or posters or whatever are you trying to target kids are you trying to target people maybe a little older you know, if it's premium ice cream, that kind of really does pivot a, a bit to where parents need to understand that this is not, you know, store grocery store ice cream where you just get a big tub of it and serve it mm. to a kid's party for seven year olds. This is for those that are going out on date night. This is for those couples that are married and still dating. You know what I mean? And so you have a, a premium to that. So now you have an experience tied with that. that's tied to the ingredients that's tied to the flavors and everything else that's about it. And it starts to become more of a holistic animal because now you remember that over some competitor down the road, you know, you're not just throwing ice cream in a tub and selling it in an aisle. Uh, mm. It's an experience. And so that's where it becomes very, uh, I guess you start to, to differentiate yourself a bit. <laughs> right. Okay. It's a huge part of hard, a uh, smart, sorry, hard, smart is hard. It's a huge part of that consistency. Oh yeah. Um, it's it's it seems like it would be a simple thing to stay consistent with your brand, but even corporate brands after a while. I mean, it just they start to lose their way because they've done so much stuff. Or they've worked with so many creative people or agencies. I mean, time just happens. It's kind of like we talk about with Google search. You know, you got to stay on top of it. Like all of a sudden Spotify is like, hey, there's another thing. And then we find out and we're like, oh, great. <laughs> You know, you just kind of have to review it every now and then. Somebody that I know that was in the military said they actually would once a year go through their service book of what this job is and have kind of a review and a refresher once a year in the army. And I thought, wow, that's uh, that's funny that, you know, our military does that. But I just realized like many businesses don't. They go 10 years without yeah. taking a step back. And I think part of the smart is that, you're, you're constantly looking at yourself, not to be critical, but you're just kind of checking the temperature to make sure that we're still using the same blue, right? <laughs> right. And that, that's a really good point. I mean, if the military need to update every year because the military evolves over time, mm -hmm. businesses definitely need to do it. Um, yep. And interestingly enough, I just got a, an email from Veronique who does the design and chooses the color and has done our branding saying, I've just found this 
um, header on Facebook and it doesn't correspond. Yeah. And it, it's one thing that somebody did. It looks fine. It looks really, really nice, but it doesn't fit in with the rest of the branding. And she's right. And what we haven't done is somebody just go through everything and order everything. What mm -hmm. we have done is just wait for somebody to come across something and say, oh, actually, that doesn't fit in. <laughs> so, happens all the time. How, how would I how would I go about an audit like that? I mean, you just say to somebody in your company, right, now go and look at everything you can find and figure out if the design is consistent. Yeah, well, people come to us and when they want to re refresh their brand or they kind of want to, they're, they're seeing a revenue drop, whatever the reason is, they come to us. That's one of the things we start with is an audit. We go out and we actively search for everything, including things that are in print. I'll ask them for brochures and business cards and, you know, everything, because even the real life stuff needs to match. And then it's like, well, what about what about your apparel? You know, I ran across a guy that's got a red shirt with right, uh, white embroidery for his logo. Everything in his branding is in shades of blue. There's no red in his mm -hmm. branding. So what are you doing wearing a red shirt <laughs> at a networking event? <laughs> <laughs> so, right. you know, there's little things like that to be aware of. Um, and so we kind of take that step back and say, like, OK, we're we're going to really refresh everything because Pantone's revised the colors. They, they, that's where it starts. Revises, I think, every year. So we've oh, actually okay. got for even ourselves a new blue and green and orange and, all, you know, and you may add additional colors that are accents um, to that. And you need to communicate across the creative team like, what is the accent for? Because web always gets overlooked. Creative is like, I got it for print so I can make a cool poster like the Wonder Woman behind me. But web sits there and goes like, but I got a button and when you hover over it, I don't know what color you want me to make that. Right, and it's a slightly different hue of the same right. color. I think hue is the right word, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can, if you want to change the, like it's orange and it kind of goes to more of a cream, that's fine as long as it's standardized in the brand. We would call it a web kit or UI kit. Um, so anyway. you, you, what you would have the standard set of colors for print and then the adaptations of those colors for the different aspects of what you do on web, like buttons. Yeah, buttons, borders, uh, dividers, form fields, active, oh, wow. inactive. There's so much in web. It starts to, that's when you're, that's when you really go into a full on brand guide. And this really does lean into the smart is hard because now you're like, how many pieces of the brand and expressions essentially are we touching? So your brand guide could go to 40, 50 pages and right. it could happen over time, you know, because right. maybe you want a certain photography style. That's the, it's now becomes the standard. If there's certain ads that go out, that can get standardized because obviously they convert the best right so yeah they can really expand it's a living breathing standards are a living breathing document that we provide every right. project i can i can almost see mary ann going no because she knows that i'm gonna contact her after this and say right now we need to start building this this web brand kit out um <laughs> but mary ann don't worry you don't have to do it. It's, there's no rush. As Jason says, we can do it over time, but it does need to be done. Especially yeah. as now we're updating the website an awful lot. And we end up with, we've now got 500 pages. A year ago, we had 100. Now, all of a sudden, if there's a mistake, it's going to be complicated if it's a different mistake on every page. And then we come back to consistency. If you're going to do it yeah. wrong, do it wrong the same way all the time. At least <laughs> then we know where to correct it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I we've had a 500 page website we developed for higher ed and they wanted to cut it down to about 100. And, you know, as you know, Google doesn't really index every page you have anymore. So there's yeah. just some pages that are just dead and you just delete them. Um, but it's like, yeah, we had to figure out, though, what pages are actually a front door that you may not realize that generate revenue. And we did find a rogue page. Weird. Nothing on it. But it led to a secondary click that went into a conversion. So it went to another page that actually is the page you wanted, but this other page led them in. So we just had to clean up the first page and keep right. it. Had you deleted it, it, it would have been like amputating a limb. It would have been that catastrophic for the revenue for the for the school. So, right. you know, there's an audit process in web that is like, okay, what pages are working and what's the trap? And then you get into data mining basically at that point, reviewing that. Uh, so you yeah. kind of have two teams operating. You got your brand team and you got your web team, and then marketing's just sitting there going, "Like, are we ready yet?" Because <laughs> yeah, right. they just want to add out. 
say. <laughs> now, there's a couple of things that strike me here. Number one is coordination, i.e. Mm -hmm. coordinating different people in the team. And number two is time, is that the bosses will tend to put pressure on people to do things quickly. And doing things quickly means you think, well, I, I, won't, I won't check the exact color. It's more or less that. I won't check the exact way to do this layout. It's probably about that. Uh, yeah. How do you deal with that? Um, seems so, complicated. It's, it is complicated, but we set expectations up front because here's the leverage that we have. And a lot of this just has to do with, you know, being post pandemic. Uh, I think a lot of people pull back and said, wait a minute, we've been literally practicing the definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And I've said, you know, how many times have you paid X, Y, Z for ads? And what has that led you to? Because you're talking to me now. Um, so we need to kind of go back and like, you know, examine the timeline, examine the budget. What were the goals? Did the goals really fit the budget? And half no, the time that, they don't, you know? And now, that, yeah. yeah. So then they start to go like, okay, I can see why this could take up to a year because, you know, we, we've got to do it right if we want to make that investment to make money, to be profitable. Brilliant. It's really difficult to convince companies that this is going to take a year and they think, mm. I expected a month or two months or three months, but yeah, to do it to properly. That. I mean, with your job and with our job, knowledge panels, brand SERPs, and setting up a proper digital marketing strategy, the Cali Q process way takes a year to set the whole thing up and a second year to get it yeah. kicking. And I'm sure it's the same for you. Uh, you would say, mm -hmm. well, in a year, we'll probably get this pretty much set up. And then we need another year to make sure it's really baked in. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. Last question is this one. How does smart design help with branded search? This is not my favorite part of the show, although the rest was brilliant. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess I, I grew up in an era when you would go into a job interview, you didn't walk in with an untucked shirt, unpressed pants, and expect to get an offer to get hired. You know, you had to dress up. You know, you had to show your, your best first impression because you only get one shot. Um, and so... With brands, um, you know, design matters for a couple of reasons because of that. It's the impression to leave a mark to be memorable for. Um, but funny enough, some of the things we're seeing in the retail space is brands are sort of not copycatting other name brands, but they're sort of they're with their labels and product design. They're sort of looking a little bit like it close enough and their products are like side by side on the shelf. And they're doing that little fool job to, in order to get you to try their product over the other brand. And sometimes it works. So we see this in ice cream. We see this in, um, you know, just pizza boxes, like everything else. Like a lot of people, when they shop and go down the aisle, they're just in a hurry, like the kids in the yeah. cart. Wee! So mom just grabs what they got. And they don't realize they grabbed the wrong thing. They're already home. And it's like, I'm not going to this again. You know, it's a whole circus to put the kid back in the car, right? Well, these companies know that. So they can design it in a way of quality that is close enough to look like something else. It gives them a little bit of an edge on the shelf. Um, digitally, Brilliant. you know, you and I know that in web, you don't want to look spammy. And so sometimes, you know, your website needs to be really navigable. It needs to be easy to go through, very understandable. And design is what makes that happen. It's called, you it, call it UX design, but it's a proven way of optimizing the experience of the user as they interact with your uh, brand digitally, whether it be a website or social or whatever, because on social media, an experience there, TikTok, it's uh, a screen and it's very quick, takes up the whole screen and it feeds that part of your brain that, oh, I'm going to miss the next thing if I don't, you know, so it just makes you want to keep doing yeah. it because you're like, what am I going to miss out on that's next, right? So there's a whole psychology that's behind that and the quality of that video, uh, it, it does way better. I think Mr. Beast is a great example when he talked about um, on the podcast with another guy about um, quality of videos. If you make one good video that does really well, you've made your month and you can just mm -hmm. do one video a month and not have to do one a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, this is a guy that's like one of the most popular YouTubers out there. So he said it, there you go. <laughs> so s smart is hard because smart takes a lot of work. And what yes. I retain from what you just said is when somebody Googles your brand name, or your personal name, make sure you've tucked your shirt in. Thank yes. you so much, Jason. Make sure your shirt is tucked in and your brand set looks great. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Next week, we're going to be talking to Sarah Mokansaye, content creation for all engines. She's brilliant. We've written a white paper together. She brought so much to the table, and she's figured all of this out, how to create 
great content that will work, rank, and function in all engines, search, answer, and assistive, and indeed in the search generative experience that Google is bringing out soon. Could you possibly pass the baton, Jason? Yeah, here you go, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> You punched me in the face. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, everyone, for watching. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, see you all next week. You get the outro song, Jason. A quick goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Jason, and the other Jason, too. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Cali Cube. It's all about your brand, Serp.